Hey everybody, this is your host, Chuck Parson. You're listening to The Life After. Obviously, we're big proponents on this show of getting counseling to help you process your deconstruction, or really, for any reason at all. Our goal is to destigmatize professional counseling and frequently remind you that it's for everyone. If you're thinking about it, just do it. You have nothing to lose, you have a lot to gain. In this episode, we'll be talking to a really good friend of mine, Ari Holtz, who's been a successful professional counselor for over 10 years, about what to look for and what to avoid in a counselor. At the end of this episode, I'll be listing off some resources available to help you find a counselor in your area if you aren't sure where to start. The same resources are listed in the episode description. So stop making excuses. Ah, that reminds me. I need to schedule an appointment. Hey Siri, call my therapist. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, we're here today with our friend Ari. Uh, Ari. Yeah, who is this guy? Who, <laughs> <laughs> who is this guy? Brady's, you... liter- Brady's wasted and he just walked in. Not. He got here five minutes ago. <laughs> for one time, I am not. Uh, Ari is a good friend of mine. Ari is a uh, professional counselor. Uh, you've been, uh, how long have you been doing this, Ari? Uh, I've been in private practice for just about 11 years. Awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Ari, uh, just so nobody's confused out there, Ari is a professional counselor. Professional counselor. That does not mean that he has an MDiv from, you know, from... <laughs> Union or Liberty University. <laughs> yeah. From, yeah. Uh, so he a has do- a, a doctorate in psychology. Clinical psychology. Clinical psychology uh, in the, in the secular Saint Arizona realm. University. <laughs> <laughs> Fuller Theological Seminary. I did. Either. I did get my doctorate at a Catholic university. Did you? Oh, I, I why com- is he on the show? Uh, uh, geez. Uh, right, well, get out! Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. It was nice. It was nice. Thanks for hanging Thank out. Thank you for listening. <laughs> but no, actually, on my in- when I interviewed at that program, um, I asked, um, you know, is is there a religious aspect to this education? Because that was not what I'm interested in. Oh uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they yeah, specified, yeah. no, it is not. It's you know, completely secular. Uh, the majority of the uh, faculty was actually Jewish, um, okay, and, nice. lar- and largely atheist. Um, so yes. my degree is from a Catholic university, but it is completely secular, scientifically based. Awesome, beautiful. Here we go. What is um? All right, before we get started, what is a little bit of your like religious background? Were you brought up religious or? Uh, I was brought up a Reformed Jew. Um, so I did grow up going to temple a little bit, uh, more than a little bit, re- relatively regularly. Um, so Reformed but, Jews, they believe in like um, the five points of the Star of David. So the Star of David has six I'll be here all week. Six. Thank you, Chuck. Um, it was a bad Calvinism joke. Yeah, I'm sorry. A, yeah, I'm was, sorry. Yeah, that was bad. Um, no, so Reform is like amongst the most liberal and kind of modern... Um, denominations of judaism we don't even say denominations in judaism that's how detached from it i am i don't as an adult i do not practice i'm not observant Um, okay i'm completely secular uh culturally consider myself jewish um but and it was really the cultural upbringing was is what it was more than a religious upbringing okay um gotcha yeah yeah. know your roots kind of thing right yeah 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 that's why kind of passing down the culture Right, right, right. Judaism separate from any sort of biblical dogma okay. um, gotcha. or belief system, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Awesome. Uh, That's beautiful. Yeah, so th- you're probably our, our least religious guest so far, although uh, we've well, had... Well, James a, we, from the Ethical Society. Yeah, we've had a couple of people yeah. that, that have never had... Dr. James Croft. Yes, um, Dr. James Croft. <laughs> so, Brady, uh, you... Uh, part of the reason that we wanted to do this is, you know... A, like, we've all, like, I think everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people that listen to this show and their experiences with, with like, religious trauma on some level have been related to really bad counseling experiences. Yes. Or, like, quote-unquote counseling uh, that has been religiously based, uh, often 
um, by people that don't have the skill set necessary to counsel people. Um, often there's mental illness involved and there's no, there isn't enough knowledge to treat it. Uh, often they're like kind of weird ethical lines cross. Like you have a, your pastor is, is, you know, counseling you quote unquote, and you, they have a personal relationship with you and are way too intertwined in yeah, your he personal life. Barbecues with your dad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, totally. And, he barbecues with your dad who is, you know, physically <clears throat> abusing you or whatever, you know, <laughs> it's like, Light stuff. and then you have to talk about, yeah, you have to talk to the guy that was just like throwing back some buds with your dad about, you know, uh, your personal trauma that comes from your mm -hmm. parents or whatever and it's really confusing uh so brady you you sort of like uh, out of, of the two of us have had the uh, sort of the more traumatic uh counseling experience what what was that like or you've had a few i think i've had a few um and they, they kind of go in a different spectrum i think that i really wasn't diagnosed with depression and anxiety until um a few years ago and i think that was kind of an eye-opening experience for me um because there's a lot of stigma that we we're brought up with and, and different ideas of what that is or mm -hmm. what causes that. Uh, but for me, the first things that I did is I, I tried to put myself through, uh, I wouldn't call it conversion therapy because that's not what it was. It was more, it was more intelligent than that and a little bit more progressive than that. But I tried to put myself through counseling because I knew that I was gay. Um, so the first same time that I did that was before my marriage. Before and by that I, you mean struggled with same sex. Attraction, <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite phrase out of the entire world. Yeah, I know. Not at all. Um, and so I knew that that would be a, a thing that would come up in my life, and I wanted to, to make sure that I had a good handle on that. So I, I uh, went through a church, and I, I got some counseling. And uh, towards the end, I think that I knew all the answers. I knew the Bible front and back, and I knew what to say and all of that. And um, I think eventually he was just like, well, what, what, do, you, what do you want? What do you expect? <laughs> you know? And so um, I just kind of learned to compartmentalized that part of who I was. But I would say the, the, the worst counseling that I got was definitely during... That wasn't um, the worst. That was... Oh, God, no. That was not the worst. That was that was actually almost a positive experience you, outside you of the... You compartmentalized your sexuality, but that was not the that, worst. Not the worst, right? <laughs> Outside of, yeah, like completely having to deny a part of who I was, you know, that that uh, that was not the worst. The worst definitely came during uh, what I... But I would, that was Christian counseling. I went to a counselor who was a Christian, and everything had to do with Christianity. Uh, but church counseling was the worst for me, and that is where the uh, pastor okay, wait, jumps real in. Real quick, how do you distinguish those two? Because uh, I, I know what you mean. But. Yeah, yeah. So the church, a church counseling, I would say, is when the pastor goes into a counselor role. Um, only equipped with biblical knowledge, maybe a couple of courses on on counseling, maybe even as like a, a minor in it. Right. Uh, of, of something you know psychology based um and has read a couple of books and then because they are the pastor they and they believe that all answers come from the bible and they know the bible well then they believe that they are now equipped to counsel someone right okay yeah is that how you would define it i that's that's exactly what i was thinking yeah i just want to I, like make it, it clear for everybody totally so uh the worst things that came from my experiences whenever i was going through my divorce, um, and it came out that my wife was cheating, and they wanted to quote help us work, you know, those things out. And um, the things that I that we experienced was very much what I hear. Uh, Donald Trump is very triggering to me because the things that he says is some of the things that the counselor said. Oh, so it came okay. to the whole like both sides thing. Well, both of you need to both, and it's like, mm -hmm. no, I'm I'm trying to be a faithful husband, mm -hmm. and 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 she has an Ashley Madison account. <laughs> The bur the burden of responsibility may be more on her end at that point. Right, right, and and I don't mean that any disrespect to her. Um, it, it just it came, it was not well done. I, what it came down to, what if it I, really felt like, is that they wanted us to do anything we could to. They wanted to do anything that they could to fix us. It was very problematic, but really, like what was in the way of us being quote unquote fixed is these issues weren't being resolved. Um, I was not getting any empathy. Um, in fact, one of um, the pastors who was like a father to me uh, said, uh, Brady, when you, and this is a direct quote, Brady, when you talk about your feelings, you sound weak and you don't sound like a leader. Um, and there was even another time where I, uh, one of the times that I found out she was cheating, I raised my voice and I yelled at her. It happened a couple of times. But one of the times that it came up in counseling, I was told that Christians 
should never be angry. Oh my God. It's so absurd. Uh, and so, um, those are literally things that would have gotten me in trouble in grad school for saying to a client in training. Right. Yeah. They should. <laughs> yeah, right? right. There's a reason for that. They yeah. should. And Whoa, so when mind blowing. they realized that they weren't getting the results that they thought that they would get, they thought, you know, here's, here's the issue. We add Bible. Now things are fixed when that wasn't happening. Um, and they realized that there was something still broken. Uh, they were so eager to fix it instead of actually like eager to get to that, to that where everything's done and, and fixed and they can tell a story about, Oh, you know, we had this, this, this couple in our church and they had problems, but then, you know, we prayed, and we worked it out and now they're fine. They wanted so badly to have that redemptive story um, that it overlooked everything that was in the way of between. Right. And, and that's people. sort of, yeah, there's a narrative, right. To a church uh, and to Christianity. There's a narrative, there's a story, there's a, there's a way that things are supposed to go. And then we're, and then we're trying to like navigate as Christians, people are trying to navigate their way into that narrative into that Mm -hmm. story and you know you read the bible and you and you pray and you have relationships and you listen to sermons and you learn what that narrative is supposed to look like and then in these counseling scenarios uh you know a lot of times people have issues problems you know uh you know whatever keeping them from from fitting into that narrative and as a matter of fact you know in, in like in your case with your marriage you guys were not healthy together. You probably you weren't good for each other, right? right so right. it was, it, you know, getting divorced doesn't fit into that narrative. But for you, both of you, that was the best. That was the best for both of us. That those. was the best thing yeah. that, that, that could come out of it, right? And that, and that wasn't really an option that was on the table because it doesn't fit the narrative. And also in the middle of all of this, you know, my, my best friend just died suddenly of heart failure. Um, so I'm dealing with, you know, dealing with that grief, but not having the ability to grieve that because at the same time, I'm having to constantly defend myself um, to these churchmen. And, 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 and the pastors, there was two of them, and it was kind of like a tag team approach. Um, and then other pastors got involved too, but they were constantly on the phone with, with my ex. They were trying to like talk me and they were uh, m- moderating all of our conversations. They were moderating um, custody plans, uh, all of this different stuff that, um, a lot of power that they never deserved or should have had. Um, and it crossed a lot of boundaries and and everything. So, um, yeah, that was, I think the most traumatizing time of my life. Uh, but I, I did have one other, one other counseling experience with a Christian counselor. And that was when I realized that all of this stuff was not working and we needed to see a professional, um, and I, and I went to a professional, hopefully with my ex-wife, but it, that didn't work out, but I stayed with this counselor for a little bit. And that's when he told me about what he calls spiritual abuse. And that was, I told him about my church situation and he said, no, what you're experiencing is church is, is spiritual abuse. They're using your faith against you. Um, and, and running you over, uh, using these Christian terms and that, that needs to stop. And so that was very beneficial for me. Um, and I would say that, 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 that Christian counselor in a lot of ways was a very beneficial thing for me mm-hmm. of kind of opening my eyes and realizing, Oh, I need to get, I need to. And he would, this was a down. professional counselor that was a Christian. So yes, he had so his doctorate. That, yeah. mm-hmm. that uh, probably understands the, where faith needs to end and science and, and, you know, things mm-hmm. like that. Absolutely. Just need to be the defining, you know, the defining factor. Yeah, Absolutely. the defining factor. Totally. Um. So yeah, that was my experience. Woo. Yeah. That was a. That's a doozy, Brady. <laughs> that's sad. Like it makes me sad to hear that that was your experience. Thank you. I appreciate. Legitimately, that. because that's not. I. That's not what I hope to provide for people that I see, and that's not what I hope that my profession. And I'm not even sure I'm in the same profession as some of the people you saw. No, I think I'm I not know. at all. No, not at all. Um, but there's some loose association there that's mm-hmm. happening because mm-hmm. it's called all, it's all called counseling, right? Um, and it it like legitimately upsets me because one, it seems like you are harmed, mm-hmm. and the main value we have, um, like I'm licensed as a psychologist, and our main value is beneficence, which just means like do no harm, right? Mm-hmm. Just do mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. Um, if nothing else, even if you're not helping people, don't hurt people. Um, mm-hmm. And to hear that you were hurt from a counseling experience or multiple counseling experiences is like legitimately upsetting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think Brady's experience uh, reflects a lot of people in 
the Christian realm, right? Which is why we wanted to have you on the show was sort of to like help uh, help people uh, sort of separate the idea of religious co- church counseling, what Brady calls church counseling, from what the profession of of professional counseling, right? Um, and sort of like help people draw some lines and understand what the differences are. And if you've had a negative experience with quote unquote counseling, um, hopefully encourage you to, to like give the whole, the whole word concept of counseling, another stab, you know, with, yeah. with something much more reasonable and, and helpful. Right. So like for me, um, you know, I, after, you know, and my, my church counseling experiences were not, they were, I would say neither here nor there it was sort of, you know, didn't have a huge negative impact on my life, but I've, I've been there, you know, and yep. it wasn't. Uh, I, looking back, I, I can see like, oh, that, yeah, there, this was problematic. That was problematic and I can point it out. Uh, but ultimately I don't think it had like a huge negative impact on my life. But, um, after, you know, uh, leaving church and, um, going through why, especially specifically when I was going through my divorce, I started seeing a counselor on my own, a professional counselor. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a totally, totally different experience, uh, uh, much more uh, insightful, more informed, more helpful. Um, and I don't think I would uh, honestly probably be a very mentally healthy person if I hadn't processed what I was going through at that time with an objective, you know, third, third part, well, second party. I don't know how you say that, but an objective uh, person on looking and, and sort of like, and, you know, offering some kind of uh, professional informed insight into my life. Right. You know, absolutely. Um, I see like a common theme with the the men that were in my life that were trying to do counseling that there was just a need for power that they wanted to control so many things. And, oh yeah. Um, and I and I see myself even even today. It is, was, an, it is kind of an instrument of manipulation, isn't it? It's sort of like a sort of becomes like a chess piece kind of thing with a lot of pastors. Absolutely, and I don't think that it's intentional. I don't think that people walk into a situation like that going, oh, how can I, you know, really mess this person up for my gain? I think that it's a part of our human nature, and if that's kind of a driving force for us, then naturally it kind of happens, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, So even today I was reflecting on different areas of my life where I, I, I still at that time, at times fall into that role where somebody wants to have that power over me and I, and I fall for it at times, uh-huh. you know? And so, um, I'm being more awakened to that. And, and this week, uh, Chuck, I was telling you that I had kind of a bad mental health week. And so I ended up seeing my therapist today. Um, and that was really helpful for me. Um, and the therapist that I saw today is the same one that I started seeing after I left the faith and was really helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, if it wasn't for the sessions that I had with him and seeing him the weeks that I saw him, um, I don't know where I would be mentally or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he actually told me that I was one of his favorite clients because I, and and, well, the reason was, is because I went in (laughs) eager to work these things out and I would be thinking about them through the week, you know? And so when I walked in, it was like, I would have these just rapid fire epiphanies where he would ask like a question or he would let me speak. And then, and then I'd be like, Oh, and that's why I do this. And that's why I struggle with this. (laughs) And it was just like this, like constant, just like rapid fire, like, so you were empowered in the room. Yes. In a lot of ways. No one was disempowering you or trying to be in control in the room. The dynamic was you were empowered to go through your own process. Holy shit. (laughs) I'm having one right now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you're absolutely it's right. It's the opposite, literally the opposite that, of... That's the, what's supposed to happen. In my, so in my world, the way I practice, I'll say, the way I was trained, that's what's supposed to happen. Or you don't have to be so kind. I know. <laughs> trying really hard to be diplomatic. And we're, yeah, before we're all we started... Like, I'm a professional. Fuck these guys. You know? <laughs> before we started, Ari was very like emphatic that he didn't want to offend people that have different mindsets within his field. And I, and I appreciate that, but you're absolutely right. Like there is, there is a big difference between with Christianity. Like when you have church counseling, not, not always Christian counseling, but church counseling, the idea is uh, the, the, the authority is up here. The authority is, is your pastor, whoever's teaching you and also the word of God. And that's, that's overpowering you and your feelings. And your job is to, uh, to submit your right. mind yes. to who yeah. they are Submission. and what they're saying. Um, whereas what you're describing is more what you're feeling and what you're experiencing is kind of 
the driving force and that's the navigator through the woods that you're trying that's to explore. That's the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. What you're yeah. feeling, what you're experiencing, the patterns of your life. Um, it's just, it's exploring it. And it's my role. I see my role as looking for patterns in that and trying to deepen insight into that to lead to positive change, not to have any agenda. That's uh, the agenda huge. is you feeling better. I mean, that's cliche, feeling better. What is that? We could talk for three hours about what feeling better means, but <laughs> like that's the, agenda. that's the only agenda in the room, in my room, in my office, um, is like less symptoms and increased well-being. Like that's the agenda. That's really refreshing for somebody like me to hear. Um, you know, we need to take a short break. Uh, when we get back, I want to hear more about uh, your philosophy, and not just your philosophy, <laughs> the actual field <laughs> of counseling and therapies, right, right, right. Um, philosophy yeah. of how, and ethics of how that should go forward. What was that, Chuck? Oh, and I, you know, Ari's personal philosophy as well is interesting to me. You know, I mean, like there's a, there's an overarching philosophy mm -hmm. of counseling and then, uh, you know, gets a little bit more nuanced with individuals, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, we'll be back. So stay tuned after this amazing commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I love our commercials. Hi guys. Priska here from episode seven. One of the many things you got to learn about me is that I'm a playwright. Almost two years ago, I created a script telling the story of deconstruction from the faith called Seven and Ten. Here's the plot. When Sarah was 14, she had a dream that God told her she and Ryan were supposed to be married. Being God-fearing man, Ryan agreed, and they began courting. At 18, they were married. Once in seminary, their friend Henry met Jenny. Henry liked Jenny a lot, and she felt the same. After a lot of prayer and counseling from Ryan and Sarah, the now well-versed and experienced married couple they knew, Henry and Jenny got married right after college. Ryan becomes a youth pastor, Henry becomes a worship pastor, and Jenny becomes the missions pastor. All at the same church. Life is simple and perfect, according to Sarah. After years of making choices at such a young age, Ryan and Jenny began questioning everything, including whether or not they married the right people. Things become complicated. Feeling her husband drift away, but not sure why, Sarah tries desperately to keep things in control. Praying more and pretending everything is fine. Things begin to fall apart below the surface, but above, everything thrives. So it's okay, right? That's part of being involved in ministries. Your life falls apart, but as long as you change the world, it's all fine. As the veils become more and more torn and tattered, and true selves come to the surface, even Sarah herself is revealed to have her own shameful secrets and hatreds, especially for Jenny. 7 and 10 will be performed at The Pearl in Kansas City, February 18th and 19th, and The Monocle, February 23rd and 24th. Tickets can be purchased at Eventbrite for $10 or $15 at the door. And we're back. Welcome. Welcome back. Uh, we're here with our friend Ari. Um, so Ari, we, uh, we're, we're talking about the sort of... So what we're trying to do with this episode is uh, sort of like uh, create a better understanding of, you know, uh, the difference between what a lot of Christians have experienced as quote-unquote church counseling and then... Uh, you know, professional counseling. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about was um, the sort of important ethical lines that over time Brady and I have realized uh, are crossed. All right? the time, right. Right, right. with, uh, you know, you heard you heard Brady's story and we've, we've chatted a little bit about mm -hmm. uh, some of these like ethical lines that would literally end a, a professional counselor's career uh, that are sort of just like, just n totally ignored, you know, in a right. lot of these scenarios. Right. Right. Um, so uh, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, interpersonal boundaries. Yeah. That have to be in place. Definitely. And so when we're talking about ethics in this context, it's not, it's not ethics in terms of mor like morality, although there's an overlap there or, kind of, am I an ethical person? Are you an ethical person? It's a literal codified ethical guideline, a book I had to study and pass a test to get a license from the state of Missouri and then I have to abide by. So when I'm, when I talk about ethics in this conversation, it is the rules I have to follow. Um, and they do overlap with what we would consider like ethics out of the dictionary. Um, but certainly amongst the most important, if not the most important, um, is boundaries. Um, and that's really talked about in our jargon as dual dual relationships and a prohibition against dual relationships. So okay. 
dual relationships are uh, exactly what they sound like. Uh, two types of relationships with the same person. Okay. Um, so we are forbidden from having those as licensed psychologists and almost all licensed therapists. Um, we all have different ethical codes, but they all overlap tremendously. Uh -huh. um, and so very simply what this means is uh, my patients. Um, I cannot be friends with my patients. I cannot date my patients. I cannot go into business with my patients. I can have, I can certainly not have sex with my patients. Mm -hmm. I cannot um, have, I cannot be friends with my patients' parents. Um, mm -hmm. I cannot have any relationship with my patients other than, uh, the therapist, patient or client, those are sort of interchangeable words, um, relationship, like mm -hmm. that is it. Um, if, a, and con on the other side of that coin, if you are my friend or I've dated you, or I know you from my kid's school, uh, you can't then become my patient because right. we already have one relationship. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that is very strictly uh, held and enforced. That's like mm -hmm. the first day of your ethics class in grad school is talking about dual relationships. And that's, I don't know if that's the number one reason people lose their licenses is for violating that, but I'm quite sure it's amongst the, amongst the highest, if but, not the highest um, reason people lose their licenses. Totally. Um, and so why is that important, right? Like why is it important to only have one relationship with your patient and that be the doctor or therapist patient relationship. Um, it's to keep things clear. It's to keep things clear about like what we're doing here, right? Like if you're my patient in my office, like what we're doing is solely working on the issues or the symptoms or the illness or the situation that you're coming for help with. And we're addressing that. That's all we're doing. Mm -hmm. There's no counter agenda. There's no agenda of, you know, I want you to like me because we're friends. I want you to uh -huh. like me because I might want to date you. Mm -hmm. Um, I might want to manipulate you later to take advantage of you financially by getting you involved <clears throat> in some bad business idea, right? All of those right. things are forbidden and, and that, and it's to protect the patients. It's to mm. protect the patients from um, therapists who act badly, want to act badly, or maybe are just clumsy and foolish. Sure. Um, and so a second reason why the dual relationship thing is really important, I think this touches Brady on one of your, uh, unfortunately bad experiences in the past is, uh, we want to, or I want to, um, with my patients, create a safe space. That's a very cheesy phrase, but like, I want my office for my patients to be this place. They can come for an hour a week or however often they come and just talk about whatever and not worry about it. People tell me things that they've never told anybody else. And they tell me that they preface that mm -hmm. I've never said this to anyone before. Right, um, right. like I'm the holder of people's secrets and they should yeah. be able to come and tell me things they're ashamed of. They're worried about, they're scared of things that could get them into trouble, things that could get them divorced, things that could get them fired. Um, and know that it's not leaving the room no matter what. That's much harder to believe if I'm hanging out with your dad at a picnic. Right. Um, or if I'm going to see you at the bar and hang out with you because you're in my circle of friends. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I'm, sp I'm this compartmentalized person in these people's lives who has a very clear and specific role. Uh -huh. um, and there's no, uh, they're, they don't have to be concerned about, you know, like, Oh, are you going to accidentally spill the beans? You know, like, yeah, no, because they don't have any, not at all. Cause I don't connections with you. Theoretically. I don't know anybody that they know. Totally. Um, it's funny you say that. Cause one of my biggest fears growing up in church was you would always hear the pastor in his sermons would always say something like, Oh yeah. I had somebody come to my office the other day and they said, and they would always give like these like sermon illustrations of people that they're supposedly counseling with or interacting with. And then they would like, uh, they wouldn't say the name. They wouldn't tell who it was, but they would say like these things. And it's like, Oh my God, like, why are you sharing this information of what people, have... somebody in the audience is like cringing. Screen. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah, like a little bit somebody's butt is like so tight, you know, at the, <laughs> right. end of the entire conversation <laughs> right. of like, you can make diamonds out of because that. presumably there's two agendas there, right? Like there's the one agenda of, I guess when that pastor is counseling the person to help that individual, but there's this mm -hmm. other agenda to, I, I, I don't know, this is how with the terminology to, to preach to the, to the congregation, to use that information as an to example. Help. Yeah. Right. And so those, mm -hmm. that's a dual relationship, right? That's two agendas mm -hmm. coexisting and that's problematic because that hurts the person potentially who's sitting in the, in the pews going like, that's my story. Like what if someone knows, what if, this other person knows that that's my story. That's supposed to be private. Like you should never worry mm -hmm. about that right. with your therapist. You should never worry. Like there are three things that I'll break. I'm obligated to break confidentiality for. Um, if I believe you're suicidal, I have to do something, you know, so you don't kill yourself. If I believe you're homicidal, I have to report that. So you don't kill someone else. And if I learn about child abuse, I have to report that mm. because you know, mm -hmm. you can't abide by keeping secrets about childs getting 
child, about children getting <laughs> abused. Yeah. Um, so, and I tell people, those are the three things I have great confidentiality for. And outside of that, that's it. Like there's no, no one will know anything we talk about mm-hmm. in here. Um, and I just don't know how you can believe that that's true if you're also having another relationship with the person who's your therapist, mm-hmm. whether that's friendly, whether that's uh, a clergy member, then them being a clergy member. Um, when I, when grad school, I taught, I taught and also was seeing patients in training. I could not see one of my students as one of my clients. I can't be their professor and their therapist at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there's implicit bias there. There's confusion. How does it feel for that person to be sitting in a room with me and I know all their secrets and I'm lecturing about Freud or something? Um, Like (laughs) that's that's a mess. It's hurtful. And it can be be used to exploit patients. It can be used to advance other agendas other Mm -hmm. than, again, just Mm -hmm. well-being, making your symptoms go away, Mm -hmm. which is the whole point. Um, Right. So uh, um, there's a couple directions I want to go with this. But um, first of all, uh, and I don't know, do you, uh, do you ever do any couples therapy? Is that a bit. Yeah. A, a bit. bit. Yeah. Um, so I feel like a lot in, in the Christian world, a lot of the reason that people go to church counseling is, is for marital reasons. Right. I mean, like Agreed, there yeah. aren't, uh, there aren't a whole lot of reasons that people seek church counseling. Um, one of the main ones I think is, is, is marital like couple counseling. Right. Um, so it, when you have a, <clears throat> And I'm not 100% sure where I'm going with this, but when you have a, you have two people involved, right? And you have a marriage sort of hanging in the balance. Um, and in, in the Christian world, there is this obligation to save the marriage, right? And that's sort of what me and what Brady and I were talking about before uh, in the last segment was, you know, uh, right. Brady was in the scenario where, uh, you know, his church was just trying to force this narrative of a saved, of a happy marriage onto right, right. this couple that, that was not going together. Could you, is there anything you would like sort of... Yeah, and I can totally speak to that. So I will, I guess I'll start by saying I do have a, when working with couples who are in distress and the marriage is in question, the future of the marriage is in question, I do have a slight bias And I will tell the people I'm working with this, a slight bias towards them staying together. Mm -hmm. But what that comes from is how awful divorce is. Um, Just Mm -hmm. how, Mm -hmm. now it's not from a moral place. It's certainly not from a religious place. Just that I've seen people in my practice and in my personal life go through divorce and what it does to families financially, what it does to children involved. um, What just, it it wreaks havoc. It's years of lawyers and it it lights a household on fire, Uh essentially. Um, So I have a slight bias towards that. Um, but there, but that's very, that, that's a very small percentage of what I go into working with the couple, um, the, uh, what I bring to working with the couple. Um, it's really in the end, what is going to be best for both people. And oftentimes that is divorce. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, if, and especially if there's things like abuse going on, if there's serial infidelity going on, again, not coming from a moral perspective that infidelity is bad, but just coming from a perspective that someone's cheating on another person all the time. Like people probably aren't happy. Like it's not healthy. Yeah, people aren't doing well. Right. Um, that's the agenda again. Um, and so it's really what is best on a case by case basis for a given couple. And if things can be made healthy and the couple can be made to stay together in a really adaptive, healthy way, um, I would like to lean towards that. But there's plenty of times where we all identify together collaboratively as a group of three people in a room that divorce as awful as it is and as hard as it is, is, perhaps the right decision mm-hmm. because it will be healthier for everybody. Right. Again, the, the overarching value is, is health and well being uh-huh. and doing good by people. And right. so sometimes it's better that people are not married. Um, yeah, totally. And if that's the data I'm mm. seeing and working with a couple, I'll never tell people to get divorced outside of an extreme situation where there's, you know, abuse going on or something particularly awful. Uh-huh. Um, but outside of those situations, I'll never tell people, I think you should get divorced, uh-huh. but they'll steer themselves there. Sure. Um, and I'll support that if I do actually believe that that is the most healthy thing. That's interesting. Cause like in I've, a lot of times, like in evangelical situations, it feels like divorce is something that something, somebody does to somebody else. But whereas like what you're saying is when it's something that you can all three go and talk about that, a lot of times it's something that you kind of decide together. Oh, interesting. and I think that's kind of like a big difference between what I experienced an evangelical world compared to mm-hmm. because there's so much stigma and, and so many religious ideas that are attached to it that it becomes a weapon um, kind of in the hand of 
a religious person sometimes, you know, instead of what you're saying is a tool to um, mutually all work towards a more happy situation. And it's, and it's, it's much, (laughs) it's much more painstaking and like painful and awful than I'm making it sound. Or we'll sit there and decide divorce is the right decision. Um, Let's do it guys. One member (laughs) is usually very upset about it. They're both very upset about it. It's crying, it's yelling, it's ugly, it's awful. Um, But it is sort of everyone sort of realizing that this is what needs to happen in that situation. Um, So I came to that realization um, when my ex-wife left, my church told me that I needed to beg her to stay and ask for forgiveness of anything I ever could have done to make her want to have an affair. And um, I said, no, I mean, we already brought her back four times. We were trying to work things out or I was trying to work things out. Um, And that's when I was disfellowshipped and kicked out of, my church is because I didn't follow that, um, demand of theirs. And I I don't know. I just look back at that and I'm just dumbfounded by, um, that ignorance and just religious. I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Like, uh, manipulation, fierceness, like, uh, yeah. Coercion. Yeah. (laughs) Both of those. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, yeah, but you're telling a different story. Right. It it comes back, I think, to something we were talking about a little earlier, um, or at least alluded to this idea of empowerment, that Mm. it's my job to help, if if we're talking again about a couple situation, to empower the couple to make the decision together that uh, for what is best for them. I don't, again, setting aside, I want to just keep putting that footnote in, setting aside situations where someone's being physically abused or emotionally abused, that is different. And I will Mm. sort of insert a strong opinion about what I think will happen there. Um, but outside of those things, it's not my job to tell you to get divorced or to stay married. Um, it's for you to get there yourself and to be empowered to make that decision as a couple yourself. When I'm seeing a couple, like the couple is the patient. I'm not on one person's side or the other person's side. Mm-hmm. I'm sort of an advocate of the couple. Mm-hmm. And so empower the couple to get through their issues and decide to stay together and work on things, which again, most times I would hope for. Um, or sometimes sadly decide you know, no, this, this needs to end. Um, mm. But that's always their decision. Again, I, I don't think I've ever told someone they should get divorced. Um, I would just never, that's not my role. Who am I to, <laughs> who am I to tell someone what to do with their life? Right. Uh-huh. Like I have a, de- I have a degree in psychology, but I'm not, right. I'm not in charge of what you should do. Right. Right. Which is, I'm not your, bo- again, I don't know, again, your dad like, or your parent or something. Totally. Oh, and I can't, you know, un- uh, underemphasize like the dad is maybe the biggest difference between, yeah. The role of a what a, the role a counselor should play in a person's life, and the role that church counseling often plays in people's lives, right? Is, well, well, I think even Christian counseling. You know, we're, I'm making a distinction between church counseling and, and Christian counseling. But even Christian counseling, I, I would say the main goal is is to be on the side of indoctrination, to be on the side of here's what we believe the Bible says. So you need we're going to psychologically manipulate you into doing what we think this should be saying mm-hmm. or, or what is right in your life, according to what the Bible says. And, um, yeah, just seeing different tools of that manipulation, um, growing up, uh, I think is it's, it's, it's hard to get out of. Um, and we were talking earlier, uh, in between segments about this idea of hell and mm-hmm. we have it so bent into our head uh-huh. that how, how did you word that Ari with, um, you, you're talking about hell and how it just seems that some people just can't get that, can't get that influence outside of. Yeah. I mean, I think if there's any, any idea that you are told again and again, if we're talking about an adult here for 20 or 30 years of your life, it becomes an entrenched uh, belief, a, a literal like hardwired pathway in your brain. Right. Yeah. And so even if you intellectually evolve to believe something different, there's still going to be that reflexive thought pattern coming back mm-hmm. again and again. And so if you're told that you're going to burn in hell for behaviors X, Y, and Z for three decades, and then you move away from that belief intellectually at age 34, um, there's still going to be a big, a loud ringing voice in your head telling mm-hmm. you you're still going to burn in hell because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, just because that's the way the brain works, right? Like repetition strengthens neural connections in the brain and it's it's interesting you made that yeah no literally yeah this is literally it's literally hardwired i mean that's literally this is a this is the way that your brain strengthens neurons anything if you yes if you're raised being told that you know uh, trees think and have brains yeah yeah, yeah. um and you're told that every single day of your life and then you're 33 and you realize that makes no sense that's nonsense there's still gonna be part of your brain that wonders right as smart as you may be as high as your iq is because 
it's wired. It's in there. There's neurons that are strongly connected around that that uh, cognition. Um, I, w- I thought it was interesting as a this was sort of the, some banter we had between segments. Um, Ari as a as a totally you know secular human being um totally made that observation on his own like i I guess you've had a few you've talked to some people maybe you've had a few clients that uh that believed in hell at some point in their life and don't anymore but it's still like the way you put it was like uh, there's still eight percent of your brain that believes that you know and i think that's really that's super common right and that's a literal that's a literal neurological thing that happens when you repeat an idea over and over in your brain. And I think a lot of, I know for me personally and f- probably for Brady and for a lot of our listeners, there are these moments where it's like, oh, yeah, hell. Like, what if that's real, you know? Yeah. And it's like there, I, I literally have no empirical evidence that hell is real. No reason to believe that hell is real. But it's just in there, and it's just hardwired, and it still comes up all the time. It's really interesting. Um, we need to take a break. Uh, when we get back, we want to talk about um, finding a good counselor, what good counseling looks like, and, and how to spot bad counseling, and those types of things. Uh, we'll be back after this short break. Extra, extra, read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, with posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. But um bum all right, and we're back. Welcome back. We have uh, Henry Cloud here in the studio talking about boundaries. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. It's uh, Gary Chapman, and what's your love language? We, sh- <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't insult our guests <laughs> like that. I'm kidding. We have Ari, and he's a lot better than all of them. Woo. Thank you. Um, okay, so Ari, um, we I think uh, we get the sense from our... The emails that we get, the messages that we get mm-hmm. um, from, you know, just talking to Christians in general. I know I have several friends um, that are sort of like afraid to get counseling, right? Because of their experience with church counseling or uh, they, or they've had a bad counselor or they went to a, a Christian counselor that was a professional and had all the right credentials, but was just not a good, helpful counselor and they felt like they did more harm than good or something like that well growing up that was like the first question is like if somebody said you're getting counseling like well is it christian counseling (laughs) you know (laughs) right yeah and it was actually an insult in my family i remember um i would have a family member that if there was an argument or something they would end it with like you need to get therapy Uh uh-huh it's like well right 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 number one you're right it's (laughs) yeah for sure yeah i mean on on top of this the stigma attached Mm -hmm. to getting therapy or counseling which we are hell bent on breaking right right we are so sick of that stupid stigma um because it's it, counseling is helpful for literally anyone anywhere in any time so ari we wanted to talk to you a little bit about um what makes a good counselor what what makes a bad counselor what are red flags to look out for um and maybe somebody will hear it and be like oh my counselor did that and that's why i had an awful experience or they'll be like oh my counselor wasn't supposed to do that. Maybe I should find another one or like, Oh, my counselor's really good. This is good to hear. Or, you know, or, or like, uh, if I'm looking for a counselor, uh, this is what I should look for. So yeah. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question and a great topic. Cause there's a lot of really bad therapy out there and not just, you know, that perhaps the type of thing, Brady, you were talking about earlier of, um, you know, profound boundary violations mm-hmm. and people who maybe aren't, qualified to do what they're doing. Um, there's people with the same <laughs> degrees and, and background that I have, they're just doing a bad job. Um, mm-hmm. like any other profession, um, there's, there's bad therapy, but there's also really good therapy and really helpful therapy. And I obviously believe in it <laughs> very strongly as beneficial. Um, and so, yeah, Chuck, to your point, what's, what's good therapy? How do you find a good therapist? So the first thing is really basically, um, like what are the person's credentials? Um, do they have a degree that uh-huh. seems appropriate? Um, <laughs> and there's a lot, there's a lot of, of degrees that are appropriate, but the main ones would be, you know, a PhD or a PsyD, which is a doctorate of psychology, mm-hmm. um, in clinical or counseling psychology, um, 
a licensed um, clinical social worker or a licensed professional counselor, counselor mm-hmm. known as an LPC. Those are sort of the main ones. I'm probably leaving some out. Apologies to the professionals who I'm leaving out. Um, licensed marriage and family therapist as well. Um, those are sort of the mainstream kind of, I want to say legit, <laughs> um, licensed by the state um, yeah. therapist. So you just want to start with that. Like make sure you're seeing someone who has a license and who has like an appropriate degree. Um, I would say also look for someone who's probably been in the field for a while. Um, we all had to see people when we were inexperienced. So I don't want to kind of badmouth people who are very new to the field, but you know, if you're, if you're nervous about therapy, if it's new to you, if it's been stigmatized in your life, maybe go to someone who's been in the field five, 10, 15 years, um, who's, who's a pro. Um, and by the way, all this stuff, every therapist has a website and is on, um, psychology today, uh, is a, is a for-profit magazine that has a psycho a therapist directory mm-hmm. that we're almost all on in mm-hmm. the kind of secular mainstream world. I'm not promoting it but we all sort of are on it um, and we all have profiles on it and it tells where we went to school, what degree we have, how long we've been in practice. It gives our license number. Um, so you can see what a person's background is. So that's just the basic thing. Make, make sure you're seeing someone who's actually a professional for what you're for looking for help with. Um, secondly, I really encourage people to interview or question their therapists um, early on, perhaps okay. even prior to seeing an appointment. So usually you can com- contact therapists via email through their website or through an online directory, um, or you call them, obviously, and ask them questions. I have people do this to me all the time. They call me and they will ask me, do you have experience working with bipolar disorder? Or do you have experience working with eating disorders? Or do you work with children? Or where did you go to school? What's your degree? I have had people ask me multiple times, are you a religious counselor? Mm -hmm. Um, Is this a Christian Christian counseling experience? To which I say, no, some people are happy with that. Some people aren't happy with that because that's what they are looking for. Mm -hmm. So like, don't be scared to ask a potential therapist questions about their background. And if someone is skittish or off put by that, don't see them. We should should all be in, we in my field, very transparent about our experience, our training, what we do, our scope of practice, um, what we're good at, what we're not good at. And if someone is like weird or off put by talking about that, like call somebody else. Okay. Uh, So that's the first thing sort of in terms of trying to find someone and identifying who might be a good person to see. Once you're in therapy, it's very much a feel. Um, Like, and these are going to, again, be sort of cliche sounding statements, but like, do you feel safe? (laughs) Like, do you feel empowered? Do you feel like the person is listening? Do you feel like the person cares? Um, is the person professional? Are they starting your session 25 minutes late? Um, uh-huh. Yeah. Are they not there? <laughs> do, do you show up for your appointment and they're not there? These are things that happen. Right, um, right, right. And yeah. all of us have made that mistake once or twice, right? Like uh-huh. I've run over in an emergency with someone and my next patient ends up waiting for a half hour and that sucks and I regret mm-hmm. it and I apologize. But it shouldn't be happening the first time and it shouldn't be happening regularly. Um, what does your gut say? Does this feel good <laughs> or does this feel not good? Does this person seem to have some sort of agenda or do they not? Um, Hmm. do they seem to be listening to what you are saying as the patient or are they promoting their own path forward for you? Um, there's this cliche in counseling of like, we meet people where they are and that's a cliche and it's beaten to the ground to death, but it's really valid. Like if I'm meeting with someone for the first time, it's my job to understand why you're in my office, Mm -hmm. what you're looking for help with Mm -hmm. and how I can adjust myself to meet what you are wanting. What I'm wanting is almost irrelevant um, Mm -hmm. outside of things that are inappropriate or unethical. Um, Mm -hmm. and so if you're getting a vibe that someone's trying to lead you in a direction you don't want to go or pressuring you or imposing their values upon you, those are red flags. Mm -hmm. And those are times when you should maybe bring that up with the person if you're comfortable doing so, or just maybe not go back uh, and find somebody else. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's like the basis of what the counseling is for a lot of us that we experienced was trying to impose that different viewpoints or trying to have in some sort of other agenda. So, you know, yeah. like what he's describing is so um, different than what a lot of us were brought up with, you know? Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's so I'm glad you asked that. It's I think that's the opposite question, in Chuck. so many ways. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's like, you're, it's like sort of church counseling is like how you're going to see somebody so that they can, they can sort of like help you fit into a mold mm-hmm. right or like a an agenda or a, a, a philosophy 
Um, and that's not what we're, that's not what counseling is trying to accomplish. Not, not, you know. And a mold and agenda that doesn't acknowledge a lot of times mental disorders or, or mental disease. Like it's not, they don't talk about that in a Bible. And so, because it's not existent within the text that they're working from, um, you're not going to fit into it. Right. Totally. You know? Yeah. Right. And it's our job as, as therapists, as clinicians to understand an individual and all of their circumstances. So that involves understanding, um, you know, their genetic history as much as we can, you know, asking about family history of depression, anxiety, different, different mental illness, understanding, um, their family background, understanding their social functioning, their relationships, kind of trying to put together a picture of a person as best we can and then address that. It, mm. like it's, again, it's my job to come to you. It's my job to meet you where you are and understand um, what you need and what will make you healthy. Mm -hmm. I don't have a pre-existing idea of what health really looks like mm -hmm. outside of some you know, very scientifically based ideas about what lack of health looks like. Uh -huh. um, you know, depressed symptoms, anxious symptoms, post-traumatic right. symptoms. Um, I have an idea of what those things are, and I want to help people move away from those. But that's the guiding. Yeah. Uh, philosophy is not quite the right word, but that's that's the guideline is um, moving away from, from symptomology into health. Um, but within yeah. that boundary of health, being whoever you are. Uh -huh. um, mm. wow. I don't so know. Uh, let's talk a little bit about... about um, and you know, we're not going to get into a ton of detail about specific mental illnesses or, th or th anything like that, but, um, in general treatment, right. Of, of mental illness or of, you know, you know, not even, even if something is not like diagnosable, but somebody's struggling with like a compulsive behavior or something like that. And, um, so in, in church, in church environments, and we sort of talked about this, uh, you know, in between segments, but um, there's sort of this like attitude like, oh, well, you need to let God fix you, right? Which is, you know, like obviously the whole basis of this podcast is that that is not how things work. <laughs> um, and, you know, as a professional counselor, that I, I don't think that was part of your schooling. Um, it was you know, not. Right? It was not. Surprise. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, um, I think a lot of Christians and former Christians sort of have, there's like a, a cloudiness or a, a lot of misunderstanding surrounding mental illness and how to treat it and how to, um, uh, you know, how to work on your symptoms, figure out your symptoms, figure out your triggers, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, could you could you comment on that in sort of a blanket way, you know, or, or could you like pick depression or something and like sort of walk through like what, like how you might approach that as a counselor? Yeah. Um, it's hard because there are these diagnoses that we all know about, clinical depression or you know, panic disorder or PTSD. And there are these categories people get placed into, but everyone is, you know, three depressed people are all different, even if they have the exact same diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, um, these are, you know, diagnosable mental illnesses are no different than other physical illnesses. And it's really upsetting to me and to a lot of people in my field, of course, that there's this stigma attached to them. Mm. Um, I don't think anybody feels that their character is flawed if they get the flu every year um, or mm. if they break an ankle or if they're diabetic or they have a heart problem or something like that. But people feel badly about themselves if they're depressed or if they're anxious or if they undergo a trauma and then struggle with um, flashbacks or nightmares or um, panic attacks because of it. Um, somehow our culture, and this is not even a, a Christian thing to my knowledge, just American Western culture has imposed the idea of a character flaw upon mental illness, mm -hmm. which makes no sense yeah. because your brain is an organ, the way your heart is an organ, the way your liver is a, an organ. And if it's not functioning optimally, um, you don't feel bad about that. Like get treatment for it the same way you would get treatment for, you know, a cold. Well, there's no treatment for a cold, but you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> for, totally. Yeah. For, no, yeah. For, for an infection. For, yeah, for uh, diabetes. Or, thank you. Right, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so first of all, I want to say like I would approach. Which, by the way, that's <laughs> really profound, I think. And I, I hope everybody heard that. Right. You know, like anybody that's struggling with with any kind of mental illness like that is what you need to know. You know, that's a really good start. Well, what kind of things? Uh, how about this? I'm going to name a mental illness <laughs> and you tell me what we would have heard in 
church culture okay. a lot of times. Yeah, and then let me, if I can add to the game, uh, let, yeah. me, let me follow it up with how oh, I would. Oh, this is yes. great. Oh, oh Brady. I'm, I'm not sure this will work, but it sounds fun to try. This is what I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so the first one that comes to my mind is, is depression. Mm-hmm. And and I think the way that we would see that is when we're in a Christian world is... Uh, d- you need to uh, you need to trust the Lord mm-hmm. uh, that He's going to uh, be everything that you need. That you um, need to you need to acknowledge that your happiness and your fulfillment and your joy is going to come from God. Um, and if you have the Holy Jesus Spirit, said, His fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy. Jesus said right. that He came that you might have life and have it to the full. Ari, so um, to me. <laughs> depression stems from, and not, again, not to me, to, to the psychological community uh, and psychiatric community, the depression stems from um, a genetic predisposition uh, towards an imbalance of different neurotransmitters, chemicals in the brain, probably interacting with different life circumstances that result in both physical and psychological symptoms. Um, and that can be treated through talk therapy often, uh, sometimes medic- medication, sometimes a combination of both. Sometimes you can do nothing and it just goes away. Um, but hmm. what you guys just said, I've never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm not a Christian, um, so I don't know, but I've never heard that conception of, <laughs> How of about, depression um, before. Anxiety. Anxiety. Oh, that's an easy one. It's a really easy one. Yeah. Um, look at the birds of the air. Uh, mm-hmm. Look at the uh, what they, is it of the f- the, f- they, the lilies they'll of the field? Toil or spin. They neither yeah. the, the birds of the air and they neither reap nor sow, but the Lord gives them everything that they need. Look at the lilies of the field, for they neither toil nor spin, but they are clothed greater than Solomon in all of his glory. Man, I'm really good at this still. I'm impressed, Ari. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it better be poetic, uh, damn it. I, I know. I, I, my eloquence will not compete with that. Um, it's kind of, it, it's a similar conceptualization as depression. It's, this is going to get boring for, for what I have to say. Um, it's a genetic, usually, this is all case by case, but usually and generally speaking, it's a genetic predisposition towards anxiety. Usually an anxious person has had anxious parents or anxious grandparents or has an anxious sibling um, an anxious aunt or uncle, um, combining with triggers in life circumstances that activate that, that, uh, genetic predisposition towards, again, certain symptomology, whether it be a nervous stomach, whether it be a panic attack, whether it be circling thoughts that one fixates on and can't get away from, um, whether it be obsessive compulsive behaviors. Um, but again, it's sort of a genetic environmental interaction, uh, that results in a certain process, um, that again is very treatable. Um, you know, most anxious people will be anxious forever, but you can go from a, a clinical level of anxiety that really impacts your life negatively to sort of just a mildly annoying version of anxiety that's kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. But uh-huh. like, but you're fine. Um, therapy works really well for anxiety and for depression, if I can put a plug in just for, for yeah. my field. Um, yeah. it, it can get better. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> paraphrase and steal Dan Savage's thing um it can but, get better uh, it can get better yeah it can it can get better i mean there are things therapy doesn't work for and i'll be the first one to to say that and mm-hmm. the science underlying therapy is its own thing um mm-hmm. it's good it's not great um but uh, it's a soft but science it's, it is <laughs> i had many friends who are microbiologists who oh, told I me know, for years I know, I know. that i'm not really a scientist <laughs> right. uh, which is okay because i don't claim to be a scientist i'm a clinician um based on science, who works based on science mm-hmm. um, but anyway for a lot of mental illnesses um I just want to say, like, you can get better, like, yeah. and you don't have to suffer. And I took us away from our game to make that no, little, that was, little that was plug for beautiful. my field. But uh, uh, Brady, I've, who by worrying has ever added a day to their life? <laughs> Does that fix you? Did that fix you? I'm fixed. All right, cool. That's, Thank you. See, that's all it took. Ari's full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told that before. I don't know. Perhaps. I, don't uh, know. I have another one. This isn't really mental illness, oh, okay. but what about all right. sexual thoughts or sexual desires? <laughs> Quote some scripture at me. Um, yeah. Uh, d- um, uh, l- uh, shoot. Uh, uh, l- uh, how does it go? Um, if, you're le- if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Yep. It is better for your, it is better for your right eye to be uh, c- cut out than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Ari? <laughs> 
Wait, that's I'm sorry. Again, I'm, I I I want to confess. That was a teacher, I, I Jesus. quote Jesus. I am ignorant of scripture. Yeah, um, no, no, no. boast of my totally. own my own heritage. Uh, that was scripture. Uh, he go, he goes on to say that's uh, about if sex. He, yeah. he goes on to say, yeah, he's he's the lusting yeah, lust. I um, think is the idea. Is whoever it, whoever lusts after a woman, it's it's gendered. Whoever lusts after a woman uh, has committed has adultery. already committed adultery, adultery in his heart. heart. Okay, that uh, heard, if yeah. your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. Yeah, um, I think he's talking about jerking off. It's okay. better for you to to live with one arm than to than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And that is my advice on sexuality. So you said I got lost and all that. Um, so you said sexual <laughs> desires or sexual thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I would say just human. <laughs> that's what? that's human. <laughs> uh, who is without them? Yeah, but like, what if they're like about <clears throat> dudes or women you're not married to? <laughs> Human, <laughs> human, yeah, yeah. Uh, being gay is not a pathology, <laughs> right? Um, although, to to uh, a shame upon my profession is that uh, homosexuality, which is uh, not even a term that's used anymore, um, was. Would you guys the, call it uh, uh, same sex attraction? We don't, don't really call it anything. Just <laughs> oh. you get like being gay, yeah, um, right, yeah. or, oh, okay, or being okay. bisexual, or being whatever. Yeah. Um, but it was in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, mm -hmm. um, the book with all the diagnoses in it that we all have. Um, it was a pathology until, I believe, 1973, and I might be wrong about that, but way more recent than it should be. Mm -hmm. And that's like an abomination upon my field. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to acknowledge that. But and kind of take ownership of the fact that we that, forgive you know, that that sucked um <laughs> that we treated it as an illness until i think the 70s and again i, I apologize if i'm wrong on that date but um that's right it that's... wasn't 1925 or 1930 it was later than it should have been but currently <laughs> being gay or hey, whatever your sexuality is is not a pathology right. an exception to that would be pedophilia mm -hmm. um yeah. which i of course would say is definitely not okay right um but yes, an adult having uh, uh, sexual thoughts about another adult of the same gender mm -hmm. is uh, is human. Uh, you, you, uh, something you said there, I think, is really important in that uh, in that it, a reason that I put a lot of uh, you know um, faith, sort of not the right word, but um, a lot not of world, a lot of my worldview is derived from from science right yeah and the thing about science is that there's room for reform you know if you if you realize that you're wrong and you can show that you're wrong and and it it can be peer-reviewed and you know verified with with using experiments and, and evidence and reason then you change the way that you approach it right and this yeah, is certainly. this is something yeah. as a as a as a clinician you have to keep up with how your field is changing yes uh throughout, over time right but in the 10 11 years that you've been a therapist you've probably had to change the way that you approach certain mental illnesses or certain you know certain behaviors or or whatever and that is there's room for that which in religion yeah. is not the case right there yeah. has to be room for that so i can kind of tie that back into you know what makes for good therapy or bad therapy i would say a therapist who's not willing to ever admit he's wrong mm. um is problematic yeah um mm. i've definitely said things to patients that turned out to be wrong i've given advice that's been bad wow um i've sort of predicted you know if you make this choice this is probably what's going to happen and then it doesn't happen um and then i say yo i, I messed up i'm sorry mm -hmm. um like I'm not infallible, right? Like <laughs> I'm a human trying to help and I'm flawed. I'm educated huge. in my field, but yeah. I'm going to, like, I'm going to screw up. Um, and hopefully not, you know, not screw up in any way that causes harm. Um, but I'm going to make mistakes and the field is going to make mistakes. There's going to be research that's going to disprove things we think are true today. Mm -hmm. Um, and any good practitioner will just take ownership of that. And when that comes up, with you know with a patient just say like yes this this didn't go well like let's um let's let's change what we're doing let's, let's change what we think right, let's be this, flexible wow um so when i and, and again this isn't just me being awesome i think this is what all <laughs> adequate <laughs> although you adequate, are, you are being <laughs> awesome. thank you thank you thank you um, it's nice for my ego but um what all adequate therapists do is in the first few sessions will say um you know, that this is sort of a collaboration. Um, <clears throat> I am theoretically the expert, but you know you better than I can ever know you. And so if at any period of time you think our work is not effective, like, please tell me that. Mm -hmm. Like, let me know. Don't leave here thinking, like, what is this idiot talking about? Why is he fixating on this issue? I don't care. Like, tell me, because I might mess up, and I want to hear from you that I'm messing up, and we will be flexible to change. And if we disagree, wow. I do think we should stay with what you don't want to stay with. Um, 
let, we'll talk about that. Like, let's let's hash it out. Let's see. Um, this is a collaboration. I, I do view it as a collaboration, and I think most most, if not all, good therapists would view it would view the work with a patient as a collaboration. Mm, yeah. I mean, if they don't, if you feel a really strict power dynamic, if you feel elements of control or being pushed harshly in a certain direction that doesn't feel safe and okay to you, um, that's not a good time. That's huge. I kind of uh, free associated to a different topic there, but no, 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 no that's that's nevertheless. That no, because everything you just said it, it communicates, like it spoke directly to my situation. And I think a lot of the situations of our listeners that um, there, when you go into a situation thinking that you have all the answers inside of a book and you know that book, so now you have all the answers and you know it as literal gospel truth, mm-hmm. you know, the, it, it, it's wielded as a weapon and it's mm-hmm. wielded as a, um, as a demonstrative, um, power dynamic, as you mentioned. And it's this idea of that here's the truth. Now you need to submit to it. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think that that's night and day different than the beneficial empirically better just more beneficial thing that you just described um your your philosophy and ethics of of counseling i think that it's night and day of, of what mm-hmm. i experience what a lot and of you know experience. even uh even when it's not sort of <clears throat> i think in your scenario it was like sort of like this uh, this very human sort of means of manipulation, right? Mm-hmm. I think there are a lot of really well-meaning uh, clergymen or, or church quote-unquote counselors that um, feel obligated to stick to the the biblical narrative, even if they're not trying to manipulate things themselves, right? You know, even if it's not a selfish thing, uh, I think there's this like obligation to sort of like uh, create it, it, it to sort of like steer this person in a way that that pushes them into the biblical narrative, even if it's if that's not you know what's helpful for them. So well, I have another example of that. Do you want to have a, one more less, round? It's less malevolent, but it's but it's just as as uh, harmful. I think. Go ahead. Do you have more more one round of our game? Okay, yeah, let's do it. Um, somebody who is not internally or externally fitting into rigid gender roles. Ooh. Um. The first verse that comes to my mind is uh, men should not wear women's clothing, going back to, I think it's Leviticus. Uh huh. And that, you, you, come on. Um, come on. That's it, not what that's saying, folks. But right. that's like really the only verse that people have against. Uh, um, um, for it is dishonorable for a woman to c- uncover her head. Is that. Or for that a man say? to have long hair. Yeah, uh, the dis the the first Timothy, Corinthians. No, okay, it's Corinthians. Uh, Corinthians. It's one of the Corinthians. Okay, uh, where he talks about how women shouldn't speak in in church. Oh, right. Ouch. Or in in meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, so, uh, yeah. There's clearly a there are clearly gender roles. Um, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submit to your husbands, uh, as. Uh, I don't remember. As you should keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Ari? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love the, following this up every time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to kind of be boring again and just say human. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Again, there could be like a really great four hour discussion on like the social construction of gender, which I'm actually not totally qualified to even talk about. Um, but that, Gender is is a spectrum. Um, these ideas of pure masculinity or pure femininity are, are, are very much social constructs. Um, and so, you know, whatever you feel relative to your own gender identity, it's just, it's okay. <laughs> like, mm. it's human. That's, you're fine. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. if, this if, guy. If, if anyone is walking around thinking that they're like the pure ideal of a male and anybody who doesn't quite feel the same way is like something's wrong with them, or same thing could be said about a woman in femininity, that's... I, Might be indicative I don't know of what narcissistic to do with that personality thought. disorder. Um, <laughs> and just profound confusion um, <laughs> or misunderstanding. Um it's like if you catch yourself wondering, like, man, what if John Piper would think that my uh, V-neck is a little too low? <laughs> I you just know? pictured John Piper in a V-neck, and now I'm blind, Brady. I can't see anymore. It's too low! <laughs> <laughs> it's 
so much to like investigate that. I have no idea who John Piper is. Like, oh, why? Uh, you don't. Uh, you don't. Like, uh, you know, 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 we didn't go there, but like, why? Why would my, a V-neck intrinsically he, be well, masculine or feminine? He, he is a part. He represents these people that are that are obsessed with. I mean, he's part of the whole like. Uh, what is it called? I the can't think of biblical what it's called. manhood and womanhood yeah. counts or whatever that was kind of created, from what I understand, in response to feminism mm-hmm. uh, to per, to protect the biblical world, manhood and womanhood yeah. <laughs> from from feminism. You know, yeah. heaven forbid. Um, and he he's kind of like hell bent with all these other people. They're the ones who signed the Nashville Agreement, okay. who is like mm-hmm. that that whole agreement of like we're not going to approve of gay people or think that people who are approving of gay people are even Christians. That whole bullshit. So anyway, like, again, at the risk of uh, launching boring. into we language like that that's <laughs> thank you that that sounds cliche or sounds cheesy um, or self helpy or something. Um, I think it's our job as as therapists to help people be their true self. Yeah. And if that's, you know, a male who is, you know, feels more on the on the gender spectrum towards what's conventionally considered feminine, um that's great. Um you know, as long as someone is not hurt, engaging in any activity or belief system that is hurting them, causing them distress or causing pain and distress to others, um it's okay. (laughs) Like, it's fine. Um, like I want people to be their true self. Mm. Um, and, and that's, that's a lot of, I think what I, and again, not just me, everyone who's decent in my profession tries to do is help people be their true self and shed the kind of commentary and narrative of the outside world that might just serve to be critical and encourage self-loathing because that's not, it's kind of nonsense. Like, where does that all come from? What is it? Um, so yeah, if you're hurting someone, if you're hurting someone else, that's a problem. Um, other than that, like wear your deep cut V neck and whatever. <laughs> and like, in like a skirt. If and, it, yeah, yeah, sure. Why right. not? Totally. I don't, I don't know. I really don't know why not. I have no answer to why. No. Not. Yeah. There I, is I no don't. answer there. Yeah. Um, this is definitely better information we ever would have gotten from Les Parrot or any of them. Today. Oh, man. That was, you, that, that was good. Did you have to Google that or did you just remember it? I know I do. That Les reference was Parrot. that reference was as deep as my V-neck. Yeah. Um, we do need to close here. Ari, do you have... Um, I, w- I want to ask you one quick question. Uh, do you have any advice or anything that you would like to say to our audience before we head out? Wow. Um I guess I would just like to I would just like to revisit the the idea of stigma, um, and I and mm. this is not and stigma around mental health and, and seeking therapy, even if it's not for a diagnosis, just for something difficult in your life right now. Um, that that goes beyond any sort of religious context. That's just in our culture, and I think it's very it's very damaging. And I just encourage people to try as best you can to set that aside and try counseling or try therapy if you think it would be helpful to you. And, and, and just don't think about it too much and don't worry and get help and, and don't suffer needlessly when there are resources and individuals who can be of help and relieve that suffering for you. Or I don't like the way I said that last part, help you to relieve your own suffering. There you go. Um, okay. It's much better. Um, so, so that's what I would, I would close with. Don't overthink it. Don't worry what other people think. Like mm. get for help. Go sit. You know what it is? It's coming and sitting on a person like my, like myself's couch and talking having a conversation once a week for as long as you want if you don't like it you quit we don't chase you down i love it you don't subscribe to us we don't charge your credit card if you don't want us to like there's no obligation right (laughs) but on that note um so subscribe to the life after (laughs) right (laughs) yeah subscribe to these guys subscribe they're they're doing a good thing there you go no credit card needed (laughs) So uh, we started this episode with uh, a story from Brady that, well, we st- yeah, we started this interview with a story from Brady that, um, you know, is a, is a source of a lot of trauma and a lot of pain um, that involved, you know, what we're, I've been calling throughout the episode, quote unquote, counseling. Um, and uh, I think a lot of our listeners and I think uh, a lot of people leaving the church um especially leaving sort of fundamentalism or leaving evangelicalism um, have been burned by what somebody, you know, had the audacity to call counseling. Mm. And um, I hope that what we did with this episode and with this conversation is, uh, is present something different and something refreshing. Um, We want to redeem the bad image that, uh, that, that church counseling has given the field of counseling. And, uh, 
sort of pick that up and and uh, uh, hopefully offer some people some hope with that are struggling with huge yeah. whatever is going on in life. Um, uh, but yeah, Ari, thank you so much. Thank it you. was a really thank great, you. It's very been a pleasure. helpful interview. Um, thank all of you for listening. And uh, I'm Chuck Parson. I'm Brady Harden. And this is the life after. And remember, if, if you, you don't, don't go, go to, to church, church, Sunday's just another Saturday. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hopefully this episode helped you work through some of those fears and hesitations if you don't currently have a therapist. If you're interested in finding one, you can use the extensive Find a Therapist tool at psychologytoday.com. You can use this to search for specific criteria like certain insurance companies, therapists that charge on a sliding scale, gender, location, specialty, etc. If you're flat broke, as I'm sure a lot of you are, or have no insurance or poor insurance, you think you're struggling with mental illness and a sliding scale thing doesn't work for you, you can contact NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, at 1-800-950-NAMI, that's 6264, or check their website at nami.org, N-A-M-I dot org. Another useful resource is 211, which you can find at 211.org, and finally, if you find yourself in a dark place and are contemplating self-harm, you can call the Life Crisis Line at 1-800-273-TALK. The numbers for talk are 8255. Thank you for listening. Now go find someone who will listen to you. Listen to you.